Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Leader Show, where each week we discuss key issues and news at the intersection of business, technology, and the humanities in hopes of making you a better digital leader. This week, we're discussing storytelling in business with special guest journalist, author, and speaker Greg Stone, plus other headlines from the world of enterprise transformation. We're live each Wednesday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and the audio recording is available on major podcast platforms. Don't forget to check us out at deinetwork.com for executive coaching, industry briefings, and peer-to-peer -peer research projects. I'm Dan Goodstein. I head up Digital Enterprise Institute, as well as ERPA AI. It's the Institute for Robotic Process Automation and Artificial Intelligence. We're a professional association and peer-to-peer -peer research network, providing education, networking, and advice to over 130,000 members globally, all around automation, AI, and digital transformation. My co-host is Carlos Alvarenga. He's a researcher, an author, an educator at the University of Maryland in Georgetown, former advisor with EY and Accenture, and overall great guy. Carlos, how are you? And good to you. Good to see you again. Nice to be back for the show. Yeah, you know, we've been doing this for long enough now that I decided I can't just do the same intro every time. I said start sounding uh, too monotonous. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start researching a random fact about you and just throw it in at the end of the too creative. <laughs> Keep it exactly. Going. Exactly. But uh, no, good to be with you as always. And, um, you know, before we invite our, our special guest to join, um, you know, I was I was sniffing around the news as I do most mornings, but especially when we do our our show here. And, you know, a lot of our, our favorite topics are, are in the news again. The one that jumped out to me was a bunch of stuff related to the uh, monopolies uh, conversation. We yeah. had the, the Department of Justice uh uh, filing a lawsuit against Google to start breaking up their their ad unit. Obviously, Ticketmaster's in the news this week, uh, testifying on uh, the, the uh, Senate uh, on the Hill. Um, and uh, amidst all of that, uh, Amazon decides to launch a uh, into a new space, uh, get into the prescription uh, drug market, uh, seemingly all all around the same time. Yeah, a lot of things in the news, right? To me, what caught my attention this morning. A, Microsoft's announced me yesterday and then the reaction in the market this morning, which was expectedly negative, but I think sort of rebounding. But of everything I saw this morning, uh, two things that really jumped out. One was that was there was human resources executive has had their annual survey of sort of what's keeping HR leaders up at night. And I found interesting that learning and development made the top five, which isn't usually the case. And, and how they said that in response to things we talked about, like AI and shifting technologies that there's a renewed emphasis on uh, reskilling the workforce, right, and helping people uh, stay in tune with what's going on. The other thing, which is a little bit unusual, and I shared it on LinkedIn, was something that I think is long overdue, and I nice to see it, and that is MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, is, has a new exhibition about supply chains, which you wouldn't expect. And what they have in the exhibition, I guess it's live, you go see in New York, is the designs right of some of the world's most complicated or interesting supply chains they're they're actually displaying them as artworks and um, i said for a long time that because i spent most of my career in consulting in supply chain management uh, that it is a remarkable thing to see how companies create product right and i was lucky enough to work with apple to work with caterpillar to work with a lot of different companies and to see how these remarkable things kind of get made and there is a kind of beauty right to to some of these structures that have been created around the world how you take and build a car for example um, with all the components that are that have to go into it I, I thought it was a really interesting article and it would worth a trip to new york or if you're in new york swing by moma and check out the supply chain as art exhibit at MoMA. i'm gonna do that i uh i'll be in town tomorrow and uh, i'm gonna add that to my my list of things to do tomorrow right so, so so I broke, but again, I think back to the, you know, our normal topic, I, I, we, we talk so much about the need to stay current, and uh, I thought the HR executive was pretty timely. Yeah, you know, and, and the, the thing that kind of struck me looking at, you know, this this list today, um, which was uh, published on, on LinkedIn, you know, we've talked about you know, a lot of the recent layoffs maybe being more of a reshuffling, uh, an answer to maybe overhiring within the tech space. 
uh, you know, at the beginning or during during the pandemic. Uh, but what what caught my eye today was a lot of the the recent layoffs are not tech companies, um, uh, 3M and and others uh, that have announced you know layoffs, retailers, uh, and and so forth. So. Um, but you know, despite that, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it seems like more. The more I speak to uh, both kind of tech execs and and financial people, the the concerns about recession and things seem to be kind of cooling off a little bit. Is that has that been your your experience as well? Yeah. It, it, again, there's been the hard landing versus soft landing kind of debate over the course of the last six months, especially. And I, I it seems to be leaning towards soft landing, right? The market has has rebounded of late. And I still think it's the way the market is pricing in risk for, the, for 2023. It's still expecting that we're not going to go into a recession or it'll be, you know, the little bounce, as they say, right? Um, not something major. But I do want to go back to one other point that you made, and that was, I've said for years, the only way Google is beaten is by, direct, by the government. It, it would take, I think Amazon as well is in that camp, that it will take regulatory action, right? for there to be competition in that space. And, and it's finally happened, at least the, the sort of the first step was taken through that by separating the ad tech from the search business, right? So uh, I don't think they're gonna get anywhere. We've talked about this before, but I'm surprised it took this long. So you think you think it's not gonna, not gonna happen though? I don't think so. I, I don't think, I, I don't think they're gonna show, they can show harm to the consumer. I think it's, they're gonna try, but I, I have a hard time thinking they're gonna win this one. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I spent a little time yesterday watching the Senate hearings uh, on, on you know, the ticket industry, Ticketmaster, and and uh, they had the the CEO of Seat uh, SeatGeek and some others. You know what really struck me, and I know I know some of its politics, but you know what what really struck me it it was it was reminiscent of the the hearings where where Mark Zuckerberg was 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 testifying. Um, it's it's amazing to me, and it reminded me of how little most of the politicians even know about technology. I mean, some of the questions they were asking the the Ticketmaster CEO about bots. I mean, it was. It was un- it was difficult to watch. I mean, it was uh, you know, unbelievable to me what what <laughs> how little they really understand the the issue. And it's it's generally that way, right? It, the, there's a kind of reactionary impulse, right? In Washington, generally speaking, and when it comes to tech, even more so, they either ignore it and are happy with it and cash all the checks, or when something that they think the public is upset about, right? Then they wheel everybody in ask a bunch of questions and then the minute the person's back in the jet headed back to Silicon Valley and you know, life goes on as normal. So the DOJ thing is a little different than that, but the hearings, it's pretty much par for the course. Let's go back and look, you said the Zuckerberg hearings, the privacy hearings, the meta hearings when that, you know, they were testifying about all those things. What really came out of any of those things? You know, the history isn't very strong that the that the government is, you know, the Congress is going to take this stuff seriously and then act upon it. It's just, I don't expect it to happen. So is Amazon getting into a new business a good thing or a bad thing? This has been coming around for a long time. I had a friend who's a venture cap person, right? And she was at a startup, this is a couple of years ago, and she went to Amazon Health in the early days. Uh, and this was three or four years ago. So if you're if you're an Amazon watcher like I am, everybody knows that healthcare has, has been the thing that they want to get into. By the way, is Apple. I've said for a long time that Apple's future is not the mobile phone, it's the watch. It's healthcare, and there was Apple actually was recruiting doctors and nurses on this kind of website. They didn't say Apple on it a couple of years ago, and I, I think the people talk about Apple Car. The the my opinion for the future for an Apple Amazon is is healthcare. It's such a broken system, and I think for innovators in the valley, right, there's just this amazing temptation to try to fix quote unquote healthcare. The prize is great for whoever even fixes any small part of this, and the money is immense. And I, I can't imagine that uh, that this isn't a hardcore priority for, for the CEO and company. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a, you know, let's just try an experiment at Amazon. I, I think this is a really strategic thing for them. It's like Zuckerberg's meta, right? This is the future, some form of, with the, of healthcare. And they tried retail healthcare. It seemed like it didn't go that yeah, well, so, yeah. right? Prescriptions is a different story. So I, I think if th- there is this secret space race, quote unquote, between Amazon, Apple, and a couple others, to who, who's going to dominate the next version of healthcare in this country? 
So I'm yeah, the sure. timing is interesting too. I, I don't know if it just you know happened to come up on my feed or if there's been some developments, but it seems like uh, you know Mark Cuban has been pushing his uh, you know cost plus drugs uh, effort uh, pretty hard recently as well. So I thought the timing of this was was interesting, and and you know the the Google thing makes me think back to our conversation last week about. Um, you know, you know, whether, whether Apple is going to continue down the path of, you know, not really being in the ad business, you know, you wonder if this, this DOJ, uh, lawsuit is more about kind of, you know, set, setting some boundaries or some warnings with, uh, some of the other firms in the, in the tech space. Sure. And it's, and sometimes these cancers are sort of shots across the bow, right? Fix your own house or we'll fix it for you. So it, it might be a little bit more of that. So, Carlos, I know um, you know you're, you're working on a book, and 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 one of the things that you and I have talked about for for probably over you know, over a year now is is the importance of of storytelling. I'm really excited to have our uh, our guest with us today, uh, Carlos. Maybe you can kind of set this up as we uh, add Greg Stone here to our to our conversation. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let Greg introduce himself. It's a pleasure to have him on the show. Uh, Greg's a fellow author. Uh, and a former journalist, communications coach, much more than, than I can do it justice. So I'll just turn it over to Greg. Greg, would you please introduce yourself to the audience and tell you about a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, I uh, always joke, it's, uh, I say that if you want to stump any spokesperson, ask him or her or them what they do. <laughs> and it's very hard for people to explain. When people ask me what I do, sometimes I joke, I teach executives how to how to talk good, <laughs> and uh, people laugh, but they immediately get that. And that's really what my business is all about: is teaching people, helping people, explain what they do, how to ex tell them how to message with authority and color, and that sort of thing. And I can give a lot of examples of that, but I'd be curious as to what's on your mind. And I don't know if we can. Uh, have the audience come in with questions, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions that uh, people might have. So where do you want me to start, uh, Dan and Carlos? I'll go ahead and lead it off, Greg. So when I worked with executives, right, and it's a private executive network I used to work with, people would ask me, what's the number one thing that kind of all executives share as a concern? I said, there's unequivocally no doubt. I don't care whether you're in finance, HR, or supply chain procurement, it is storytelling. You're always telling stories up to the board, right across to your peers and, and sort of down toward the organization. And they really struggle with this. In fact, if we had an event where, where a reporter or a writer would come in and, and talk about storytelling, it was always the best attended event that we could put on. So maybe just get your thoughts about story, literally storytelling in business, right? As an executive, you're not typically trained in this. And suddenly you become senior vice president or chief digital officer. What's the first thing you would do, or how do you begin to understand storytelling in the business context? Right? Well, uh, that's a, a great question, Carlos. And let me approach it with a bit of history too. Time was when CEOs and people in the C-suite believed that it was their job to do and the job of others in the organization to explain. <clears throat> people would say, I don't need to explain things. That's what my communications people my ad agency, my PR agency do. But now you have to both explain and lead, and that's a problem. And too often, the attitude is this. There's an old joke that uh, the CEO says to the speechwriter, I need you to write a speech for me. So the speechwriter says, about what? And the CEO says, about 30 minutes. <laughs> and you know that's that's the attitude that I'd have to speak for 30 minutes and all I need to do is open my mouth and talk without thinking about the audience without thinking about the audience and the cliche in communication is to talk to the audience but that's the wrong preposition you want to talk about the audience an example that I'm fond of giving uh, has to do with my late mom who passed away about uh, 7 years ago very bright woman never went to college heard Harry Truman speak in New Jersey, where I grew up in the late 40s. I wasn't alive then, but uh, you know, I, was, I was, uh, wasn't even an idea in anybody's head at that point. But if you remember from history, and I know, Carlos, you're a student of history, that Truman was considered to be way behind in the polls. But my mom heard him speak, and she said she was impressed with him. Now, why? Because he, what did he talk about, among other things? 
he talked about the price of pork. The price of pork is too high in the supermarkets. And that resonated with her because she and my dad were knocking nickels together. They were just starting out in life. And that convinced her that he understood her life. Now, she was bright enough not to vote for him just because he understood what the price of pork was. But he convinced her that he understood her life. Now, I've done a fair amount of political consulting, and I've learned that people vote for candidates for three reasons. Number one, does he or she care about me? And actually, number one, what will he or she do for me? Get me a job, raise my taxes, lower my taxes, you know, solve the opioid crisis, whatever. Number two, does he or she care about me? And number three, which is arguably most important, does he or she understand me? We want our political leaders to understand us and the way we live. And the same is true with business leaders. Too often people talk about the product, about the service, about themselves, about their colleagues, about the history of the company. And they don't talk about the customer. What does the customer care about? What does the customer care about? So the story, the speech belongs to the audience. The audience completes the cycle. And that's what people don't get. I mean, they just want to prattle on. Now, you mentioned, and I'm not certainly not knocking you at all, Carlos, because I thought your discussion with Dan was, was very insightful. But you said that learning and development, surprisingly, are in the top five the top five issues, among the top five issues on HR people's minds right now. So if you're an HR person and you're explaining this to your bosses or to the public, and you say the number one issue is learning and development now, we found that people are more concerned about learning and development for the sake of improving themselves and blah, 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 then you've said precisely nothing. But if you bring it down to a level that resonates with the audience. We're, our people are concerned about learning and development. So let's talk about our free tuition plan, our tuition reimbursement plan for courses that you can take on any topic that you think is important. People have studied art, they've studied management, they've studied mathematics on our dime. And here's a story about what that meant to the life of one particular employee whom I was speaking to just recently. So you bring it out of the stratosphere down to sea level, which is where we all live. We want to hear about what's going on at, at sea level. Correct. Let me follow up with that because if I were to add a code to the story I just told about C-suite, it was that the hardest stories to tell were the ones about quote unquote transformation. Right. And 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 this is where they really struggled, right? We are here today and the board, somebody, the street, whoever wants us to be in some other place tomorrow. And building kind of that narrative bridge between present and future um, was something that that executives, no matter how accomplished they were in the roles, often struggle with. Any thoughts on that particular type of storytelling, where you're where you're taking us a, a team, trying to paint a picture of what the future is going to be like, and why this sometimes painful process of transformation is worth it? Interesting. And Carlos. Uh, uh... Forgive me, Dan, I'm, I'm not directing my comments only to Carlos. I happen to know Carlos. Uh, we've had a, a friendship for a while, and I know he's a classical scholar. And uh, I know you're familiar with Ovid's Metamorphoses, which Ovid was a Roman poet. And practically everything we know about mythology comes from Ovid. So why do I bring this up? Because the title Metamorphoses, myths are about transformations. You take Pygmalion, right? He falls in love with a statue that he's creating. And lo and behold, what happens? That statue comes to life. You know, Daphne is being chased by Apollo, who's lusting after her, and she's running away. And to escape, she turns into a tree. So the best stories are about transformations. You think of Kafka, Kafka's story, Metamorphosis, Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams to find himself transformed in his bed into a giant insect. So here's a man who turns into an insect and he's lying on his back and he's completely helpless. That's what makes good stories. And so if you're going to talk about transformation, you need to try to capture the drama in it. 
Which brings into mind something that uh, I talk about in a book that I wrote about storytelling, that uh, this is piggybacking on some research that was done about the quality, the types of stories that CEOs tell. And research was done on this type of story from the pages of the Harvard Business Review, from interviews that CEOs, real CEOs had given to the Harvard Business Review. The overwhelmingly most common topic was epic stories about beauty and vision and big passions. So, I mean, for instance, let me, let me just read you something. This uh, is uh, an example from the then CEO of Swatch. So listen to this. These are direct quotes. How did we launch Swatch in Germany? Did we saturate the airwaves with paid advertisements? No, anyone can do that. We built a giant swatch. It was 500 feet high, weighed 13 tons, and actually worked. We suspended it outside the tallest skyscraper in Frankfurt, and so on. He goes on to say that uh, we also, he talks about, uh, uh, we hung a giant swatch in Tokyo, in the Ginza. By volume, Swiss companies account for more than 50% of all the watches. We account for 75%. So do we broadcast these figures? No. We are sympathetic to Japan. We didn't want to be arrogant. He said the Japanese are sympathetic to us in return. Quote, we're nice people from a small country. Swatch is a Swiss company, right? We have nice mountains and clear water. They like us and our products, and we like them. So you can see this is an example of what we would call vision, vision in action. You know, a, a simple, unarrogant, straightforward advertising plan in Japan, a giant swatch that's 500 feet wide, 500 feet in diameter in Frankfurt. And uh, I'm, we moved a little bit away from metamorphosis and transformations, but those are the best stories, right? The hero's journey the classic hero's journey. The hero goes on a journey, encounters difficulties, surmounts them, and comes back transformed and shares his or her insights with the, with the world at large. So how do you do that in a corporate setting? Well, it's hard, right? It's hard. But what about your history is built into the products that you, that you make every day? With Apple, where did it come from? A lot of the, a lot of the ethos of Apple came from Steve Jobs' father, who said, when you build something, make sure the part that doesn't show is as beautiful as the part that does show. So he, apps, Jobs made sure that anyone who took apart any of the products, which consumers rarely ever do, would see something beautiful on the inside too. That's why he liked rounded corners. I mean, that concept of rounded corners, it seems normal, it seems typical now, but phones used to have corners, devices used to have corners like this, right? Sharp corners and Jobs instituted the concept of rounded corners. That in itself is an example of a, a transformation, a metamorphosis. And it, you take the sum total of 10,000 things like that and you have Apple. Yeah, it's a great example, Greg. I, you know, I, I actually had in my notes to 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 mention the the ad campaign, the famous ad, you know ad campaign around the iPhone as a, as an example of, you know, you know, and, and Apple's been written a lot about certainly from a sales and marketing standpoint around, you know, hey, you have these you know five thousand features, right? But and we and we advise when I do my you know. Uh, Go to market sales and marketing strategy work. Um, that's often the example that we give to to companies that are very technical and very engineering centric to say, hey, it's it's nice that you know it's got these technical specifications. But if you think back to you know Apple releasing that, first of all, they focused on you know one or two features that they thought were going to be revolutionary, not a thousand technical features. But to your point, they they also uh, through that ad campaign and otherwise did a great job of, of, of telling a story about a world. Um, and to your point, Carlos, that, that they were talking about a transformation. Nobody had ever seen a phone and an iPod and all the other things right into, into one box. So it's a, uh, it's a great example. I, I actually have a, uh, a post-it on my desk that I almost forgot why I had it here. Uh, and it literally says storytelling, right? Because I remember taking a, a course years ago where they talked about, 
you know, how important storytelling is from a, from a sales and marketing standpoint. But I'm, 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 I'm interested, Greg, you know, beyond sales and marketing, you know, where else within an organization do you see this kind of lacking and, and, and are there any particular areas that, um, you know, you see as a gap? Uh, I would say the short answer to that is everywhere and uh, it's lacking everywhere. And part of the problem is the dreaded PowerPoint. I mean, my my comment on PowerPoint, this is a stone original and you can borrow it, but you have to give me a royalty, is that power corrupts, but PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, it's just so true because people think the story is in the PowerPoints, the story is in the deck, the story is in the bullet points. No, it's not. The story's in you. The story is in you. And I think people really need to pay attention to that. Another thing that people do is they don't begin strong enough. Usually people begin with something corny like, hey, it's an honor. Good morning. It's an honor to be here today. And I'm so happy to be here in Cleveland addressing the Chamber of Commerce. And boy, it's snowy outside. And that's not a beginning. That's that's just rote. I mean, Winston Churchill famously said that opening opening amenities are opening inanities. And he said, there are many things in life that give me pleasure, but public speaking is not one of them. So he would not say it's, it's a pleasure to be here today, because even though he was a great speaker, he worked very hard on it. So the beginning is really powerful. How you start a story. Most people start corporate meetings. I mean, you're running a meeting. A meeting, you, there's a story that you're trying to convey, a story you're trying to get people to share, to absorb. So most people start with the agenda on the first PowerPoint slide, which often goes on for seven minutes. And, you know, that's just plain boring. I, uh, I did a lot of work for IBM back in the 90s, and I was not at this meeting. I wish I had been, but I heard about it. There was a PR czar in the company by the name of John Awada, who is still there, as I understand it. But he arrived at a PR boot camp uh, late, and it was a weekday, of course. And the first words out of his mouth were, I'm sorry I'm late, but Lou and I went to the movies this morning. Lou Gerstner was the CEO at that point. So everybody's like, you went to the movies? It's like 1 o'clock on a Wednesday. Who goes to the movies on a Wednesday morning? And he said, we went to see a screening of The Lion King. Again, this is mid-90s. And he said, most of you may not realize, but a lot of our technology was used in the creation of the Lion King. Now that's a beginning. Yeah. That's a good beginning. I mean, you that person would have my attention no matter what else he went on to say. So people don't pay enough attention to that, to hooking the audience's attention right away. And going back to what I said about speaking about the audience, that brings up a model that I developed in a book which is the villains, victims, heroes model. Just bear with me a second. Alfred Hitchcock famously said that great villains make great movies. And the same is true in business stories. Now, what is the villain? The villain need not be animate. If you're uh, Facebook, maybe Google is the villain or Apple, but that's not what we're about here. The villain is the problem that the product or service addresses. The things that keep your customers awake at night, the things that cause them angst or extra expense or suffering. I mean, I have, if I can share screen for a moment here, uh, click present, is that right? And then at the bottom of the screen, is that right to share? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then share screen, share screen. Okay. Uh, Window. Um, Oh, never mind. I I can't uh, seem to make it work, but that's okay. Um, What I was going to say is that I have a chart in my book about the heroes, villains, and victims model. Let's take an example. Healthcare. You talked about healthcare before, that Amazon is making incursions into healthcare, along with everybody else these days, right? CVS has clinics everywhere, it seems. <clears throat> What's the villain in healthcare? One of the villains is death, of course. One of the villains is disease or a bad outcome to a surgery or suffering. Or a villain is dispassionate care as opposed to compassionate care, right? Who is the victim of this? The victim is the patient and his or her families. And the heroes of the story, as it were, are the doctors, nurses, hospitals, drug companies, 
that offer valuable therapies, valuable medicines, valuable counseling in a way that helps the patient and the family. So we can talk about any any industry. And if you identify the villain, that's the point. If it's a corporate meeting, it doesn't have to be that dramatic. Maybe the villain is just, hey, you know, what's going on in our Latin American division? That's what we're here to talk about today. Our, our revenue is way down in Latin America. That's the villain. Now let's talk about why. Yeah. Let's talk about why. That would get everybody's attention as opposed to three or four screens on PowerPoint about the agenda. You know, get right to the point. Get right to the point. I was. I was gonna say the villain. The villain is the PowerPoint. It's the, it's the my, my phrase. My phrase is death by PowerPoint. It's it's uh, you know we're Absolutely. almost like a kind of death. But you know you bring up a you know the, the other part I wanted to go to was you know okay so so people watching may say okay I get it you know that's how you sell that's how you market but even internally right uh, to get to get things done we had the the head of data and analytics from Twilio on a couple of weeks ago and you know we were talking about how important it is for them to you know, be able to communicate and, and, and really tell a story differently um, to the C-suite that they might, from what they might, you know, have to explain to their colleagues who understand data and analytics. So, you know, I think about scenarios where, like that, where your own career, your own success within the organization um, really depends on this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I always ask people, have you ever heard a corporate presentation whether it went on for 10 minutes or 40 minutes and said to yourself, man, that was so great. And every single one of those slides was fantastic. I wish that guy had 50 more slides to show me. <laughs> no. once, once I think in five years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I guarantee you that a great presentation did not depend on the slides or the PowerPoints. You know, which brings me to another concept that I explore in my book which is the concept of my island's theory of messaging. So the, the theory is this. Think of every message that you want to convey as an island, right? And your messages collectively are an archipelago or a group of islands. Each island should contain the message, proof points, preferably statistical, and an anecdote. So if Amazon is trying to justify, let me see if I can channel Amazon now. I have to make myself bigger to do this. <laughs> but uh, if, if Amazon's making incursions into healthcare, they might say the problem is that people don't have access to affordable prescription medicine, prescriptions, right? That's the message. The proof point is that 75% of people say they're frustrated with their pharmacy. 83% say, I'm making this up, of course, they're paying too much. And 90% say they don't get timely delivery. Well, at Amazon, we specialize in timely delivery. You order your prescription, you can have it the next day. And an anecdote is we spoke to a customer, potential customer, Jane in Pittsburgh, who sometimes has to wait two weeks for a life-saving prescription, given the vagaries of the mail, especially when the weather is bad in Pittsburgh and blah, blah, blah. So you can start the, the message with the story of Jane. You can start with a statistic or you can start with the message, but you need to weave all three in. And you know, the most important of these in some ways is the anecdote. One of my favorite communicators is, well, actually, let me give an example of the power of a statistic first. Uh, this is from um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Great book. I recommend it highly. But he, the cliche is, Leonardo da Vinci was a restless genius who was creative in many fields, right? So what does that tell you? Nothing. That's like saying Moby Dick was about whaling. But this is how he explains it. Listen to this. He, da Vinci, filled the opening pages of one of his notebooks with 169 attempts to square a circle. In eight pages, he recorded... 730 findings about the flow of water. In another notebook, he listed 67 words that describe different types of moving water. Now, who comes up with 67 words to describe different types of moving water? Hardly anybody, but that shows you da, Vinci, da Vinci's genius right there, right? His obsession and his ability to just zero in on the problem at hand. So 
a stat is very, 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 very powerful. Very. Right. Powerful. I wanted to change up a little bit. I'm thinking about my own career in consulting, even before working through my way through college and a bunch of other different roles I've had. Right, the service, the Marines. I always come back to one word, and that's creation. It, in almost every setting where I enjoyed going to work, that includes when I was a bus boy, right, in one summer in college. What was nice was you created something, right? Even when you're setting up the restaurant before we open, you know, you had all the tables, everything was sort of ready to go. The customers are, were going to be coming in pretty soon. And, and the team, we're all college kids, right? We took pride in a small way that the place was ready to go. We had created a nice place to eat for for customers, right? And in the service, we what you know, we worked on airplanes. So watching the jets take off early at six o'clock in the morning, right? That those those sorties had been created by the work that we had put in, maybe sometimes overnight, getting everything ready to go. Fast forward to uh, my first job as a journalist and convincing a team that we're going to build this great newspaper, right? And and in consulting as well convincing a client that the effort to create a new supply chain or to create a better organization uh, was going to be worse. So for me, it always goes back to this idea that people fundamentally, the thing that they take, they'll take the most pride in looking back in their career isn't how much money they made or what title they had was what they built. Right. And the stories you tell is that the three years I, I worked at a startup, building a startup, right. Or, or building a team and, I think those stories in business are the ones that are the ones that re they resonate the longest. The, the the time you had where you and people around you built something. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just pouring myself another glass of water here. Excuse me. Um, by the way, if you're ever speaking, hot water or warm water is the best. If you drink, you go, you sit on a dais, and I'll get to your question, I promise, Carlos. You sit on a dais, what do they do? They put out a pitcher of ice water. The worst thing you can do for your voice constricts the throat. You'll never see an opera singer drinking cold water backstage. Hot tea, hot water, yes. I'm also told that chocolate coats the throat and uh, impacts the voice adversely. I'm not sure about that because I love chocolate so much, but I'll take I'll take the have to try that sometime. But to your point about you're really talking about creation and mission, connecting people with a larger sense of mission. And that's hard to do. That's hard to do. But, you know, the best run companies convince people that, hey, the person pushing a handcart in the warehouse in Amazon is helping make people happy by getting the goods that they need in timely fashion. Uh, Amazon is not famous for treating its people well. So I would seriously doubt if that sense of mission pervades because people I think are more worried about not getting punished for making a mistake in those warehouses, but that's a different story. But isn't but, that the most amazing thing, right, Greg, when you do come across a company? Disney was a client of mine. Okay. And it's something you get pretty cynical about corporate speak and mission and vision, all this stuff. But I tell you, when I work with Disney as a client, they walk the walk, right? They, they walk the talk. I, I always had the sense that for the most part, right? It, it didn't matter whether you were the person to, driving the shuttle, taking gas into the park, right? Or you were, a, a, you know, a head of procurement. I mean, people really bought in to that they that every piece and every job and their cast members famously, right? Not employees, but um, but that everybody really helped make the experience great. And it was rare to find it. I, I'll never forget my time with them because it was one of the few companies that you really had a sense that everybody bought into that, right? That vision of, of the future wasn't just something that was said by somebody on a slide deck somewhere. Yeah, that's uh, and that's hard to inculcate in your workers. There's a famous story about JFK visiting NASA. And I'm always amused uh, that uh, sometimes I quote this to clients because uh, when JFK was trying to motivate the country to to support the moonshot, he said in his inimitable Massachusetts accent, you know, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> uh, you know, we do things because they are hard. And that's it. You know, if you really want to get anywhere in life, you have to do something that's hard. Do something that's hard, hard for you, hard for anybody, hard to accomplish. But anyway, to the point about mission, JFK is visiting NASA headquarters down in Houston. 
comes upon a man in a, in a janitor's uniform and being a politician, asks the man, what is your job here, sir? And the janitor looks at the president like he's crazy. And he says, my job? We're putting a man on the moon. So, you know, if you can have that kind of mission, here's a guy pushing a broom, cleaning the hallways, and he feels that he's part of this large mission of putting a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. It doesn't get much better than that. Great stuff. And that's hard to do because mission statements are notoriously vague and imprecise. I always tell my clients, look at your website and look at the websites of all of your competitors and compare the mission statements side by side and see if you can tell the difference. Ah. And sometimes I'll tell you a little secret. If I do a, a media training session, I'll read a quote from a competitor's website and say, so this is how you describe your business, right? And they go, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly it. I said, this came from your competitor's website, not yours. So everybody's mouthing the same cliches, the same abstractions, and calling them messages. You know, I had a client that will remain nameless, and they said, this is the new plan. This is classic. Our new strategic plan, it's a three-pronged effort. It consists of execution, innovation, and customer service. And that was the end of the story. Was, was breathing the fourth bullet? Right? Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like, okay, so I heard this and I'm supposed to execute, <laughs> innovate, and serve the customer. So what exactly do I do when I go back to my desk? Yeah. You know, how about if you say it this way? Uh, we want to raise our customer sat. Our customer sat's good. The customer satisfaction surveys are good. 72% say they're very satisfied. We want to bring that up to 90% by the end of this fiscal year. Okay, that's a little more specific. And here's how we hope you can help us do that. And oh, by the way, if you do it in your department, uh, that drastically increases your chances for promotion or probably will be reflected in your bonus. Now I'm motivated, right? <laughs> now I'm motivated. That's a message that resonates with me. I get it. More customer sat. Better job, more money, and also more satisfaction for me, right? Ultimately, if my customers are satisfied, I'm going to feel more satisfied. So too often corporate messages are just vague. If you want to laugh, read mission statements. And you want to say, who in God's name wrote this? And do you actually expect audiences to take this seriously? Who are looking at this for the first time that they're going to this is what's going to make me want to do business with your company i always say read the mission statements and that could apply to my dry cleaner yeah right, right. Mm -hmm. my dry cleaner is fantastic she came to this country from korea she has two kids one in medical school one in nursing school wonderful person execution innovation customer service i get that to the 10th power from her and everybody else in her organization and also done with a smile on, on their faces. I delight in going in there. Greg, I'm wondering, you know, I'm, you know, look, looking at your, uh, your past work and, and client list, there's a, there's a huge variety in the, the types of companies you, you've done work for with, from, from ancestry.com to banks, citizen bank, capital one, uh, service industry, Dunkin' Donuts, Harvard medical school, big tech, IBM, uh, healthcare, 3M, Timberland. Is there a is there a common denominator there as far as where they're struggling with their other than the mission statement? Uh, uh, you know, with their with their communications. Um, without getting specific about any one client, I would say the common denominators are often, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, misconceptions about how the media works or the media work. I should say it's plural. Uh, pay attention to your grammar, Greg, uh, or misconceptions about uh, about the audience, not focusing on the audience. You know, I went, I spoke at a, a conference for people in architecture, engineering, and construction, the so-called AEC space. And a guy got up and gave a talk about sales. And I thought, okay, I don't know about this, but he was fantastic. He said, the first thing architects do when they go to a new client is they have their whole team so, you know five six people and they list the resumes of everybody on the team and the number of years that they've worked in the industry and he said if that's the criterion then the client should pick 
the firm that has the greatest amount of experience and all the employees. And if I'm a client, a commercial client, to say I own a hotel and I want to redo the lobby, do I care about the resumes of the people who are sharing the desk with the main presenter? I don't care about that. I assume that they're good. That's why I brought them in. I want to know, what are you going to do for my lobby? Show me the design for my lobby, please, and tell me what your thoughts are behind it and why we should hire you as opposed to the two or three other firms that we're, we're interviewing. And it's not longevity, right? It's not resumes. It's, it's, you know, focusing on the customer's problem. And I think that's what people miss. And when dealing with the media, people don't focus on the needs of the reporter. Do you know what's going on in the media today? I mean, staffs have been cut. It's ridiculous. You have people even at major publications doing multiple stories a day. I have a pharma client and one of the in-house PR people, really bright guy, used to work for one of the leading pharma news sites. And I asked him, I said, how many stories would you do a day in your work as a reporter? And he just left the journalism field maybe 18 months ago. He said eight, typically eight, eight stories a day. Right. Wow is right. So you have to be aware of that if you're a pharma executive speaking if speaking to a pharma reporter. This person needs it quick. He needs it simple. He needs it fast. I mean, it should be Insta story. Just add water. You want cream of story, you add milk, but you have to tee it up for that person. And people don't get that. They just want to prattle on and they want to indulge in a lot of cliches. Here's this new drug. Here's what it does. Here's where it's uh, been approved. And here's the side effect profile. And here's some stats about the safety. Right? I think this issue of simplicity is really key. Uh, my The first partner I ever worked with in consulting was a remarkable guy. He didn't, he didn't, he hadn't attended a you know fancy school or anything, but the guy was phenomenal at his job, hugely successful. And I and I I met him because I he got hired to kind of ghost write a book for the guy. And what was interesting about it, he would always say, everything gets in consulting gets sold with the, with two two as you say two Polaroids, like the, the before and the after picture. <laughs> That's it. So when you write the proposal show me the before picture and when all the checks have cleared and all the projects are finished and all the lights are out show me the after picture and he would send a proposal back two or three times say, i don't see it i don't see it if i can't see it and i and this is and i'm in the business how is the client going to see it right and it was a phenomenal lesson of of being able to to clearly paint the picture of what the client's issue was and if you couldn't do it then you didn't understand the project right and then and the second half explain to the client after all the work is done and they've hired us, right? What is their life like? What call that they hate doesn't come anymore or what call that they want does come anymore. And I think just to add on to what you said, Greg, I think you're absolutely right. Is that ability to simplify a message down to the really the most important thing you want to convey to someone when you walk off the stage is the thing that people don't do because it's hard. It's a lot easier to throw a bunch of stuff and hope one of the, something lands. Exactly. Seven days honing something right down to the to the most important thing, and let me just pass that one thing on to you. What we're here today as human beings, for the next half an hour, that takes so much work, and it's it's the lack of work in removing things, which we know as writers, it's easy to add stuff to to a book. Taking stuff out is much harder, and I think mm -hmm. that's any the advice I would give to anybody. Absolutely. I could not agree more. I violently agree, as, as they say, Carlos. And it reminds me of uh, something that Winston Churchill said, that it would take me five minutes to prepare for a speech that lasts all day, but all day to prepare for a speech that lasts for five minutes. And then there's that famous quote from Pascal, who said, I'm sorry I wrote you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. You know, it's hard to boil stuff down. And you know, good journalism stories, and you know this, Carlos, you've been a journalist, you answer the questions who, what, where, when, why, and how, right? The five W's and the H. But to me in business, the two most important of those are what does your product or service or your company do and how does it do it? What do you do and how do you do it? And sometimes people don't think to explain that. You know, it's a piece of software. Well, everybody knows what it does. 
No, they don't. Uh, I don't know what you're saying. These 15 minutes, I would always ask my team, uh, whenever anybody new came, uh, it's, who are you and what do you do? And say it in English. And I tell you what, it was the hardest question you could ask a consultant. Mm -hmm. yeah, value, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Like, make it sound like work, my boss is saying, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. Right, tell me who you are, what do you do, and make it sound like a job. And it is one of the most painful things to take a team through to try to, to, to distill what do we do in this practice for clients? And then, you know, who are we? What do we do? And make it sound like it's a job. Right. And that's something that they read in HBR. Exactly. You know, I want to uh, share with you one thing, if I may, about the power of anecdotes. We talked a little bit about this, but this is a, a transcript of a broadcast that Edward R. Murrow did uh, during World War II from London. Radio broadcast now. And remember, I always say the pictures are better on radio <laughs> because the pictures that you conjure up to accompany a story are more powerful than anything that's shown to you. And when you're explaining something to someone, you're like a radio announcer. It's as if you're describing a movie to a blind person. But anyway, listen to what Murrow said, again from London during World War II. This is his words. So once the, the bombing stopped and the all clear was given, that I should say that as a prelude, he said children were already organizing a hunt for bits of shrapnel. Under some bushes beside the road, there was a baker's cart. Two boys, still sobbing, were trying to get a quivering bay mare back between the shafts. The lady who ran the pub told us that these raids were bad for the chickens, the dogs, and the horses. The chickens, the dogs, and the horses. What does that tell you? War is hell, not just for people, but for the animals, too. Here's this horse scared out of its wits, shaking like this, and the boys are trying to get it back between the staves of the baker's cart. Why? Because life goes on. We have bread to deliver. Notice he doesn't use cliches like the horrors of war or the indomitable spirit of the Brits in the face of these horrors. He shows you with specific examples. Little, you know, boys are, are already organizing a treasure hunt for bits of shrapnel. I can see the three of us doing that, right? Yeah. After the bombing, it's going, hey, cool. Come on, Carlos. Come on, Dan. Let's go find some shrapnel. You know, if you're a seven-year-old boy, that's that's what you do. Or girl, whatever. It's, it's you know, you make the best of it. It's a, It becomes a treasure hunt. Go figure. A treasure hunt after a bombing? Mm -hmm. But that's what kids do. Kids are, they're walking, talking, surviving survival mechanisms. They just keep going. Kids are much more persevering than adults are. You see that in cancer wards in a hospital. In a hospital, the parents are, you know, I did a lot of work for Dana Farber and for uh, Johns Hopkins and also for Sloan Kettering. And the parents are, are dying in grief and the kids are r racing in scooters down the hallways in the middle of their, their chemo because kids just know what it takes to move on to the next minute, the next day. And he captures all that, but without those ideas, without those abstractions. That's why, I mean, Edward R. Murrow was a genius. If you want to learn about storytelling, take a look at his, listen to his radio broadcast. So anyway. Well, great, Greg, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, hopefully we'll have you back uh, at some point and you can tell us what you've learned in the, in the next uh, the next few months uh, here, especially as the, you know, as you say, the media space has, has changed so much. Uh, I'd love to you know, pick your brain ag again on uh, what's happening there. But uh, uh, reminder for everybody watching, you know, we're here to help. We're not just here talking to ourselves. Uh, if there's a project you're working on or you're looking for uh, additional insights, research, uh, or what have you, uh, let us know. DEINetwork.com is the place to visit. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll be back next Wednesday. Yes, Carlos? Absolutely. Uh, Greg, thank you for joining us. I, I wanted to talk to you about ChatGPT. We didn't even get to that, the okay. sort of the future of AI and writing and storytelling. So that's, we'll save that for the next uh, time you're on. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you very much for having me. We'll see you next week, Wednesday noon, Eastern, 9 Pacific. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.